Hello all! For those of you who do not know me, my name is Royce Cumming and I am calling in from the United States. And I am presently working on my PhD at the American Museum of Natural History and the City University of New York. And I have three different projects to share with you today. The first is one that I briefly introduced at the last meeting with my goal to have each species of leaf insect freshly hatched nymph illustrated. And I am happy to report that so far things have been moving along smoothly. The reason I want to do this is because the freshly hatched nymph leaf insects are pretty unique, with many species able to be identified based upon their unique coloration, which is not the case for many of the middle instars that really all look basically the same and can really only be identified once they reach adulthood. The issue with freshly hatched nymphs, however, is that they never sit still, usually have their legs flailing around, and oftentimes have their abdomen curled, which makes seeing features and doing a comparison side by side very difficult. Which is why I reached out to scientific illustrator Liz Sisk to illustrate the freshly hatched nymphs in a uniform and clear to see manner. And I must say, the results have been fabulous. Over the years, I have been saving every image I could find and begging all of my friends who raise leaf insects to take photos from every angle and send them to me so I could share them with Liz. She then looks them all over, sketches the outlines of the shape and color blocking, blocks out her plan for the coloration, and then goes through and blends shades, and adds details to create a final nymph illustration. Here is an example of some of the different genera she has been able to do so far, and I think they are turning out really beautifully. If you want to try and guess which are which, I will reveal the names in just a moment. Not only can you now see all the details at once by presenting them flat, but also this allows easy side-by-side -side comparison. How many of these different genera do you recognize? Here are the different genera which Liz has done so far. Some are definitely tougher to recognize as they are not in breeding yet, unfortunately, like the Nanophyllium chitoniscus, so you're probably not familiar with these yet. Besides doing different genera, Liz has also been working her way through as many species as she can as she works through the hundreds of photos I have saved for her. Here are various phylum species. Once they are all laid out side by side, it is now much easier to see features which they all share versus what features allow differentiation for different species. In some cases, it has even been possible to illustrate variation commonly seen within a species, such as phylum Jacobsoni from East versus West Java, consistently having slightly different white markings. She has also made great progress for the Pulchrophilia, which I think are really beautiful nymphs with such great bright colorations. But Liz still has many more to work on, like the Cryptophilium and several undescribed species that need to be named, before we can offer a leaf insect nymph poster with all species and culture side by side but hopefully in the next couple of years, we'll have a first draft ready to share with you all. And speaking of Cryptophyllium, I am sure that by now, most of you who try to keep up with everything going on in the world of leaf insects have probably seen the large paper we had published earlier this year, which described the former Solipicum species group as a distinct genus, the Cryptophyllium. This work was over two years in the making and was thanks to a massive number of people, including many co-authors and dozens of people sending us samples and photographs for this work. It really was a community effort. This genus of leaf insect is pretty widespread and reaches the farthest north of any modern leaf insect and can be found from sea level up to 2,700 meters elevation with one of their hot spots of diversity appearing to be Vietnam, where species are very restricted, oftentimes to single mountains or ranges. But the reason we decided to name this genus the Cryptophyllium, meaning hidden leaf, 
is threefold, despite it being a rather widespread genus. First, it is because these insects really are masters of camouflage. Second, because this unique genus has been considered nested within phylum for so long, so it was essentially hiding in plain sight. And lastly, we also found several cryptic cryptophyllium species, which morphologically were impossible or nearly impossible to tell apart until we had our molecular results which showed their unique evolutionary history. The uniqueness of this group has been suspected for over a decade now based upon morphological evidence, such as the female antennae having the fourth segment flat and disc-like, which other true phylum don't have and the males having a two-hooked vomer, which is full unique within the phyleids, as no other leaf insect clade has this feature. Also, for everyone who has bred these species before, you have seen that their eggs are pretty unique, with short, moss-like pinny instead of the typical long, feather-like pinny seen in true phylum, and their nymphs can be easily distinguished by the shape of their legs and their coloration. So, all in all, once you focus in on fine details and observe a wide selection of species, you can easily see how unique these are. And of course, once we had a well-supported molecular results, it was clear that this group of leaf insects were not nested within the phylum as once thought, but are instead their own genus. In the end, we were able to molecularly sequence almost every species of cryptophyllium with many species sampled across wide swaths of their ranges, allowing us to understand their variation within a single species. At this point, we are now only missing molecular data from two very rare species, Athanesis from Sri Lanka and Yapicum from Micronesia, which means in the future, anytime someone finds a specimen of either sex, they can simply sequence the specimen and immediately know if it is the opposite sex of an already known species, or if it is a yet to be named species. And thanks to this wide sampling, we were able to describe 13 new species within this single work, which was incredibly exciting, but also why it took us two years to write. Also, we were very excited to present a couple of firsts, like the first published photo of a live Athanasis male and female from Sri Lanka, and the first photos of the holotype Celebicum, which for several decades was thought to be lost, but really it was just in the wrong location and labeled with the wrong name. And despite being at least 179 years old, I think it looks pretty good. And because I know that for many it seems we are somewhat turning the leaf insect world on its head sometimes by describing new genera, moving species around, and describing a seemingly endless number of new species, I was asked to write a recurring column in the Phasmid Study Group newsletter to help share the updates with you all. So if you are a fan of leaf insects like I am and want to stay up to date on everything, then be sure to check it out. For my final couple minutes of presentation today, I want to introduce you to one of my PhD dissertation chapters I am currently starting on and very excited to share with you all. And that's my review of the Phasmatodea camouflage, coloration, and its phytochemical basis. Of course, you are all familiar with phasmids and their beautiful array of colors, sizes, and forms. But obviously, what phasmids are best known for is their impressive camouflage, masquerading as moss, lichen, leaves, and sticks in order to seamlessly blend right into their environment to avoid being eaten by predators. And not only have they perfected their morphology to match their arboreal habitat, but their behaviors have evolved to really drive home their masquerade. With everything from their colors and their textures to their choice and habitat fine-tuned for that perfect camouflage. And you all know my favorites are the leaf insects, which I think have some phenomenal camouflage. And here is one of my absolute favorite examples. I'm going to give you a couple of seconds to pretend you are a hungry bird looking for an easy meal in the canopy. How many leaf insects can you see? 
Now, to be fair, I am only going to give you a couple seconds to look, so I will reveal them in three, two, one. Did you find all nine leaf insects hiding in the canopy? Of course, this would be a especially difficult task if the canopy were moving from wind also. Now, as far as camouflage is concerned, multiple studies have reviewed the different elements that make up camouflage, such as coloration, light reflectance, movement, texture, etc., that make up a believable act in order to fool a predator. And what has repeatedly been found is that perfect matching of coloration was more influential to avoid detection than other aspects for identifying prey. When you think about it, it makes sense. In a world full of variable shapes and sizes, and especially in a canopy full of movement, if you have an adaptation that helps you perfectly match the colors around you, you are less likely to be spotted than another that develops the wrong coloration for this particular habitat and ends up getting eaten. One ecological aspect which is closely tied with coloration are the early stages of life as many phasmid eggs are mimicking seeds, and many species just fling the eggs to the ground, which, when some species hatch, the nymphs might be brown, red, or black, to blend into the dead leaves on the forest floor. This is an issue, of course, because as soon as the nymphs walk into the green-dominated canopy, they stick out as clearly the wrong color. Amazingly, the phasmids have found a way to work around this issue, as some phasmids have evolved the ability to change their colors to ensure they always blend right into their environment and maintain that perfect camouflage. This ability to modify their coloration is actually pretty rare in the insect world, as many insect colors are on or within the exocuticle or endocuticle and are permanent, unable to be changed between molts. Some insects can adjust the color of their exoskeleton with each subsequent molt by changing the chemistry of the fixed coloration within that particular molt, but they cannot change those colors between molts as those are rigid and fixed. Whereas many arthropods which can adjust their coloration between molts, such as some phasmids, have their coloration based within living cells below the cuticle in the epidermis and therefore their coloration can be changed as the contents of the cells are changed or as pigments are being moved around within the cells. This ability to change colors facilitates important adaptations for these masters of camouflage, such as the ability to change their coloration to match the environment, the host plants they are living on, adjust to the seasons, or rapidly changed as their lifestyle changes, like you saw with the freshly hatched nymph going from red on the ground to green in the canopy. Research into the structure and basis for coloration within phasmids has not been as widely reviewed over the years when compared with the very popular butterflies and beetles, but phasmid coloration is likely based on a number of different pigments, such as terrines, melanins, carotenoids, flavonoids, biles, omicrons, etc. And likely, many combinations of these are probably at play. For color-changing insects, there are two main ways in which color change can happen. One is physiological color change, which are often rapid, taking only seconds to hours, and for example, can be controlled by microtubules in the epidermal cells facilitating the movement of omochrome granules along microtubule bundles and responsive to visual cues to induce darkening and lightening. The other method is morphological color changes, which are slower, taking days to months as they involve catabolism, the breaking down of complex molecules to form simpler molecules, or anabolism, which is the building of complex pigments from simpler molecules. Excitingly, past studies have found that both methods are possible within C. morosis, as it is able to both move pigments and build more omochrome in response to external stimuli. In order to begin to unravel the evolutionary history behind phasmid coloration, we are beginning our review with one of the more complex colors within phasmids, 
the carotenoids, which are a somewhat universal source for several common colors in insects and animals, typically the yellows, oranges, and reds. Additionally, we are starting with carotenoids because they are phytochemically based from their diets, which, when you think about it, makes sense. If you are trying to blend into the leaves, why not simply steal the leaf coloration and use it as your own? To briefly summarize the structure of a carotenoid so you can understand why we are so excited about these, they are simply a long conjugated hydrocarbon chain, which is their backbone, and on either end they have their functional groups, which influence their coloration depending on what is attached where and how. We are also beginning with carotenoids because when they are associated with other molecules, they can have colors that range outside of the typical carotenoid colors. For example, the blue coloration seen in live lobsters is carotenoid based, but with an associated protein changing the color. And when you boil a lobster, you are breaking that bond and changing the coloration from the modified blue to the more common carotenoid red. Additionally, carotenoids have many diverse functions in animals, including vision, pheromones, vitamins, antioxidants. But importantly for insects, they are commonly used for coloration and are modified in different ways according to the insect's particular needs. Unfortunately, there has not been a great deal of work done with phasmin carotenoids over the years, but the few species which have been reviewed thus far have had some overlap and some novel carotenoids recovered, with many appearing to be derivatives of beta-carotene. Unfortunately, few species have been reviewed so far, not yet spanning widely across the phasmid family tree. Within the species that are able to modify carotenoid functional groups, it looks as though it is probably a system of one gene likely responsible for one modification enzyme, which acts on one or both functional groups. And therefore, in order to modify a carotenoid in numerous ways, a suite of genes are needed, each responsible for a different function. Therefore, evolutionarily, as novel genes arise in different phasmid groups, this allows carotenoids to be modified in novel ways and can influence their coloration, which may be closely tied to their survival and diversity. Therefore, our central hypothesis is that the differing ability of phasmids to sequester and modify carotenoids is linked to phasmid morphology, and phasmid ecology evolution. Although past works have helped to pave the way for our proposed study, there are a number of shortcomings. One issue is that they did not control for host plant, so they did not know if the insects were simply sequestering directly from their diets or actually modifying the functional groups. Another is often their results are recorded as a presence absence, not as quantities, so the ratios of different carotenoids in the insects are unknown, which, for our coloration work, the ratio of different carotenoids will influence their overall coloration. And finally, for most studies, the entire insects were sampled, so they were reviewing more than just as present in the exoskeleton, and therefore more than is present in just their camouflage. Thankfully, with phasmids so popular as pets and in live exhibits like the Long Island Aquarium, who we are partnered with, we now have an easy access to an evolutionarily significant assortment of species, which we can characterize and keep track of exactly what carotenoids they were feeding on throughout their development in a controlled setting. At present, we are still perfecting our extraction and separation techniques but we have so far had promising results from the jungle nymph and the Philippine leaf insect, both of which are bright green in color, but with notably different carotenoids sequestered. Some, such as beta-cryptoxanthin, was exclusively within the insects and present in both species, but not present within the host plant they were feeding on, whereas others, such as beta-carotene, were recovered were from all three samples as relatively prominent. Once we are satisfied with our techniques and confident that they are recovering all carotenoids present within the host plant and the insects, we will be moving on in a number of future directions. 
One project we will be doing is reviewing the intraspecific variability in coloration, particularly for species which exhibit notably different color forms despite being reared under uniform conditions and all feeding on the same host plant, such as these beautiful Phylum laterontii. We want to know if these differences are due to different modifications to carotenoid functional groups or just different ratios of carotenoids being sequestered to create these different colorations. Also a side project we will be tackling will be looking at the intergeneric and intraspecific variation and looking at different life stages to see how different phasmids change color in different ways and how they modify a uniform host plant in different ways such as using different enzymes, which may be unique to one group and absent from another. And of course, in the coming few years, we will be planning to review an evolutionarily significant array of species across the phasmid family tree to search for overall evolutionary patterns and associated traits. Are different abilities to modify their coloration or carotenoids linked with morphological traits, different egg laying strategies, lifestyles, or host plant choices. So hopefully by the next meeting, I'll have a great deal more results to share with you all. So please stay tuned. And of course, I am happy to answer any questions you may have. You can uh, message me at Royce Cumming on Instagram or email me at philiade.walkingleaf at gmail.com. Thank you.